here's yet another video of me in my classroom. Um, well, it's not a video of me, it's an audio of me in my classroom, but you get to follow along with it. Um, I thought the audio was pretty good, so we're just gonna keep this one. We're going to be exploring in this mini video all the different organelles, um, from the nucleus all the way down to the vacuole, the peroxisome, and the lysosome. So uh, without further ado, let's step right into it. All right, so that's what holds the cell together. Hmm? All that. That was all the cytosol and the cytoskeleton. So now we've got the exterior of the cell, and we're going to start going from the inside out. I'm going to talk to you about how we're making protein, how we're making polypeptides. First off, we need the directions on how to build a polypeptide. They're contained in the nucleus. The nucleus is double membrane bound. That means it's got two distinct bilayers to it, and that's important for later. You've got, sorry, this pen is dying. One bilayer, two bilayer, or one set of phospholipids here, another set of phospholipids there. That protects it really, really well because you have a hydrophilic region, a hydrophobic region, a hydrophilic region, a hydrophobic region, and a hydrophilic region. There is water in between the membranes, or an aqueous solution between the membranes, yeah. But yeah. Its job, the nucleus's job, is uh, to protect, organize, replicate, and express the genetic material. That, that, which one? Helm's Deep? Yeah. I, I went with Helm's Deep because it has an outer wall and an inner wall. And that's the, and that's the key for the nucleus. Yep. The nuclear envelope uh, completely surrounds the nucleus, and that makes it hard to get in and out. You need to be able to get through this. The only way through is with a set of proteins called nuclear pores. Now look how complicated these proteins are. You've got this layer on the outside. Tell me about the amino acids in it. Up here. Hydrophilic. Oh, and then we're going through it. And then we hit an aqueous layer. Hydrophilic. And then another hydrophobic layer. And then we're back to hydrophilic. Those charges and those um, structures in the amino acids make a big difference here. But the only way in and out of the nucleus is through those nuclear pores. They're like a tunnel going through a mountain. Inside the nucleus, you have chromosomes. You probably heard of chromosomes. You did probably a lot of work with them before. Chromosomes, this blew my mind when I found out, don't just hold the DNA. Chromosomes our DNA. Yeah. Crazy. Just wrapped around some proteins. So you've got these chromosomes that are made of DNA in the nucleus. And then DNA has all of the directions on how to build proteins. Inside the nucleus, you have another small um, structure called the nucleolus, the little nucleus. The job of the nucleolus is to build ribosomes. What are ribosomes good for? We talked about it just a few minutes ago. What? They help build something. They build the bonds between polypept uh, between peptides. They build polypeptides. What kind of reaction is that? It is a condensation reaction. I'm not. I'm not going to pick on her. She's got this now. You totally have it. I'm good. So the ribosomes help create polypeptides. You got DNA that can be converted to RNA in the nucleus. So we've got our cell membrane, plasma membrane. Inside there's a nucleus. In the nucleus there's a nucleolus. The nucleus is double membrane bound. In there we have our DNA. The DNA can be trans. Uh, cribed to RNA, and you're also building little ribosomes. We need to get the RNA and the ribosome out of the nucleus. How do we get them out of the nucleus? Through what? Through the nuclear pores. So we get the um, ribosomes out of the nucleus, we get the 
RNA out of the nucleus, and they're going to go into the cytosol to create polypeptides. So now we're going to get into this whole process of how we build a polypeptide. Polypeptides, um, it's not random where they're going. They are tagged as they're being built with a chemical label that says, hey, I'm going over here. It's just like when you go to mail a letter, you have to put an address on it. You just don't just like write somebody's name and stick it in the mail. Um, unless it's Santa, and then it always works. It'll always works. Yeah. I think you still have to put one or one or something. Or something. So we've got uh, these polypeptides. Now remember, with polypeptides, they are going to undergo a hierarchy of structure. They're going to end up with a three-dimensional shape. During the process we're about to talk about, they are kept in their uh, original uh, primary structure through these things called chaperone proteins. Pretty much it's like you guys can't touch. Uh, so they keep them straight until they get to their final destination. The first place they go as they leave the nucleus is the endoplasmic reticulum. The endoplasmic reticulum surrounds the nucleus. <laughs> That's a weird looking thing. It's this network of tubes. They're flattened. Um, and they're filled with an aqueous solution. There are two distinct parts of it. The rough and the smooth. What do you think the difference is? One in, uh... Well, one's covered in ribosomes. One of them is rough. Yeah. It's got bumps on it. This is the rough endoplasmic reticulum. It's, made, it's covered in ribosomes. This is what's closest to the nucleus. The ribosomes come out and they bind to it. The, um, DNA, the RNA comes out and binds to those ribosomes. And when it does that, it starts to push the, pep, the polypeptide uh, as it's being made into the endoplasmic reticulum. So let's say... Doo -doo 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 -doo. Oh, I hate this pen. No, no, they, they don't. They, they end up breaking off and going and doing something else later. Oh, yeah, it's not like they just stay there forever. Yeah. Um, so we've got our endoplasmic reticulum. It is membrane-bound, which means it's made up of what? Membranes, thanks. What's the membrane made of? Phospholipids. The RNA binds and starts to thread in the uh, polypeptide. Here's a better image. I'm not even going to draw it. Look. Right here on the, on the screen, you got a ribosome binding to the RNA. They bind to the endoplasmic reticulum, pushing in a polypeptide. In the next lecture, we'll go into detail on what happens there, because that's an important step in um, protein formation. Now, this in the, endoplasmic, the rough endoplasmic reticulum, you're going to get the proteins originally sorted out. They get tagged. Newly made proteins are going to end up, they could be inserted into the membrane. As they're being built, that's the time to get them sort of the hydrophobic, hydrophilic, hydrophobic regions. And uh, you get glycosylation. Great word. Glyco, when you hear glyco, what do you think? Sugar, because glucose. So glycosylation is adding a sugar, adding a carbohydrate. Artist rendition, absolutely. No, I'll get. Into, I'll show you what they actually look like in a sec. So, all right, you got sorting proteins, inserting newly made proteins into the ER, and performing glycosylation. Glycosylation is adding a carbohydrate, adding a sugar. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum is attached to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. The difference is no ribosomes. Now this, this is a real picture. It has lots and lots and lots of twists and turns. Now in biology, whenever you see lots of twists and turns, the reason is to add surface area. The more twists and turns you have, the more reactions you can have. So you're going to get things attached here. You're going to get things taken off. Functional groups get added in here. This is also a place where you build phospholipids. This is where the phospholipids get created. So then they're shipped from here out to other parts in these balls called vesicles. 
So this is our uh, phospholipid. Again, next lecture, we'll talk about how they're actually created. But it all happens in the smooth ER. It is. It's totally crazy. From the uh, endoplasmic reticulum, the polypeptide can move to the Golgi apparatus. This is a series of flat disks that are not connected to each other. They are going to interact by moving vesicles from one point to another. So what that means is, if I was to have over here a, uh, a flat disk, over here a flat disk, I need to get the protein from here to there. It's going to travel. Hmm? Well, it's in order to move from e from the endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi or within the Golgi, you have to create these things. So what will happen is you're going to create what's called a vesicle. This is going to start getting, there's going to be a ring of actin filaments that form there. Actin causes action, and they start to form a ring around one end where that polypeptide is. And it starts squeezing tight. It's like, um, like a pimple. Uh, more like a, like a belt on a really large person. Um, if you start, you, and you've seen, okay, you've seen people wearing clothes that are way too small for what they should be wearing, right? What ends up happening? That's right, bloop, thanks. <laughs> bloop, you're spilling over. The stomach distends. It's like you're cutting deeper and deeper. And let's say this is like a, like a Saw movie or something. If you were to take that belt and keep pulling, what would happen? You split in half. So that's what's happening here. It's getting tighter and tighter and tighter until eventually it splits off. So now you've got this thing called a vesicle. It's just a bunch of phospholipids surrounding a protein. Now we've got to move that polypeptide from here to there. It's got to travel. What's it traveling along? Um, I imagine it's traveling between the two. What is going to act as like a railway or rail system in the cell? Well, no, we're moving from the endoplasmic reticulum. It's part of the cytoskeleton. The little things, the microtubules. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So you got microtubules here, and then we've got to move from the um, from one side to the other. The microtubule itself is going to do it. What else do you need? That's just the rail. You need the... You need, well, it's not phospholipids that push it along. What pushes it along? Motor proteins. And the motor proteins carry it over here, at which point it fuses and releases the um, polypeptide. The Golgi apparatus is good for two things. More glycosylation, because we can't get enough of that adding more carbohydrates, and also proteolysis. In proteolysis, proteo, protein, lysis, break down, you're breaking down a protein. You're cutting it. Now, the, well, a lot of people think this doesn't make much sense. We just built this, why are we breaking it now? And in order to explain it, I draw your attention to cookies. Um, I like cookies, yeah. Uh, if you, <laughs> everyone's like, now I'm hungry. When you're thinking about cookies, hypothetically thinking about cookies, um, if you wanted to make a fresh cookie, a single fresh cookie, okay, like five, because who eats really one? Um, if you were to make five fresh cookies, you're still going to make a batch of cookies, right? You're still going to make 12 or 20 or like a 50, whatever, however many you would normally make. Because it is just as easy for you to make... 12 is this to make 5. Well, the oven's already on. The oven's already on. You've already got all the equipment. You're taking the time to do it. You're expending energy. So what this is doing effectively is saying, all right, we've got this single peptide that's really, really long. Let's just cut it now. And now we have two for the same price. So the Golgi is important for secretion. The endoplasmic reticulum tends to send things around the inside of the cell. The Golgi sends, tends to send it out. It's like long distance delivery. So you can release things out into the extracellular environment, sending them out, getting rid of them.
And then you finish sorting out these proteins, and from the Golgi, or the endoplasmic radiculum, you can go to any of these other organelles in the cell. You might go to what's called a lysosome. Hey, what does the word lice mean, or the, term, the prefix lice? It's lice, something that's in your hair. It's like, so think, um, like Lysol, you're thinking. Lye is the strong base. So yeah, what this is, does is it breaks things down. Hydrolysis, lysis. So you're going to cut, or you're going to break down macromolecules. And the reason you do that is to recycle the pieces. Recycling is important. Because when you recycle components, you don't have to build it from scratch. Inside the lysosome, oh, this is where some of that chemistry comes into play. You have to have a low pH. Is that acidic or basic? Acidic. acidic. These have a very, very low pH to them. That is how the enzymes, the proteins, work best. How is that low pH maintained? How do you keep that stable? What? Using buffers, Using buffers right? So you have buffers in there. That keeps the pH really low. The lysosome continues functioning. Now, again, this is an acidic environment here inside the lysosome. What would happen to the cell if the lysosome was to break open and rupture? It would kill like everything in the cell, right? Except it wouldn't. Why? Because the cell has buffers that overwhelm the lysosome's pretty small. You've got buffers that'll overwhelm it. So you keep the cell alive. If a lysosome was to burst inside the cell, nothing would happen. Just like your appendix. Just like your appendix. <laughs> Except then you die. Um, you might have vacuoles in the cell. Vacuoles are great for storage, regulating the cell volume, and helping digest things. They're a pack. They're, they're like big empty areas. They're like storage boxes. Plant cells have very large vacuoles. Animals have very small vacuoles. They can help regulate cell volume. Here's what's called a contractile vacuole. It fills up with water, and then you use energy, and you push the water out. That stops these uh, cells from bursting open. Hydration. <laughs> Hydration. Um, they help in digestion. A cell will deform the membrane around the edge and wrap around the food particle. What causes the changes in that cell membrane? What filament? What causes that action to occur? So you see this food is being swallowed up. The plasma membrane is wrapping around it. What is causing that action to occur? Actin filaments. Actin causes action. And then a lysosome will bind and digest that food. Well, a lysosome. Several dozen lysosomes will bind and digest the food. Another organelle is called a peroxisome. Peroxisomes break down hydrogen peroxide. We talked about this. why is hydrogen peroxide bad? Why is hydrogen peroxide bad for a lot of cells? It does. Why does it wreak havoc? What does it, what does it turn into? That steals these electrons like crazy. It, it, it's going to create oxygen, but what? That, okay. Hydrogen peroxide. Peroxide, right, is a turn. It's bad. It's bad. Good, good. It's bad for bacteria because it breaks down into what? Smaller pieces. So, okay, yeah, it does that will steal electrons as an unstable ion. Hey, I'll just tell you. It's a free radical. Ah, oh, free radical. Stupid on the test thing. But that's negative ions everywhere, right? That make up electrons. Where's that positive ions? So hydrogen ion. We'll get into that later. I got to draw that out. Sorry, I got to I have to really in, in picture what you're saying. So you got free radicals that are uh, that can break things down pretty easily. They break down bacteria. Peroxisomes have a, a, a protein in them called catalase, and that catalase will turn hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen, and that's what releases the bubbles. 
Bacteria that don't have these peroxisomes, they take that hydrogen peroxide and they turn it into a free radical. Yeah. Oxygen. So that peroxisome, peroxisome in your cells, you've got like the antidote to hydrogen peroxide in your body. Your cells take that and they convert it into water and oxygen. And that's what makes bubbles come up when you put hydrogen peroxide on. So we've learned about all the different organelles functioning together to keep the cell going. Uh, we talked about the nucleus, which is a double membrane bound organelle responsible for storing genetic material and protecting that genetic material. It organizes chromosomes. Um, it's got that nucleolus in it that produces a ribosome um, that produces ribosomes. And those ribosomes can leave through the nuclear pore where they'll attach to the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, that endoplasmic reticulum is made of two parts, the smooth and the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Um, the en uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum is important for inserting proteins into the membrane. It's important for um, organizing proteins and being able to get them ready to ship out to other parts of the cell. Uh, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum is really important for um, to expanding the membrane itself and important for protein modification. Um, from there, we go on to the Golgi apparatus. The Golgi apparatus is useful for, um, uh, for protein sorting. It's also very useful for proteolysis, so breaking proteins up, so the smaller proteins, and for glycosylation, which I love. Um, we also, uh, the Golgi is responsible for secretion out of the cell. We talked about vacuoles, which are good for storing materials. They're good for uh, maintaining volume, and they're also good for helping in digestion, uh, digestion of the, the cell digestion, not, you know, your digestion. Uh, peroxisomes are useful for, uh, they've got catalase and enzyme in them that speeds up the breakdown of um, hydrogen peroxide, so it's not dangerous to the cell and produces water and oxygen, whereas lysosomes are uh, digestive organelles, they're going to have a very low pH environment maintained by buffers, because you can't get away from buffers, um, and they serve as the recycling center of the cell. They encourage hydrolysis to break apart these uh, macromolecules. Uh, and we can use hydrolysis to recover energy and monomers that can build new components. So we talked a whole about a whole bunch. Once again, you've got some content review questions. Um, these content review questions are going to be very useful for focusing your studies. Um, in the next lecture, we're going to talk about the energy production system of the cell, focusing in on the mitochondrion, the chloroplast, and uh, amazingly enough, how they may have been separate organisms to begin with, but they got incorporated into the cell. So I'll see you then.